to the book of Luke chapter 17. I want to do a double take on a portion of the scripture that our master laid down before we spend the bulk of our time in Revelation chapter 22 verse 11. Luke chapter 17 verse 20 through 27. Again, the Pharisees came to our master. And if you know the framework or the context of the Evangelion, the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you are looking at the two opposing systems. We call Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John the gospel versus religion. The gospel is summed up in the person and work of the Lord Jesus. And Jesus was found constantly antagonized and interrogated and challenged by the ruling authorities of Israel. And we have the same thing occurring here. And a very germane statement is raised in Luke 17, verse 20, where it says, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered and said unto them, The kingdom of God does not come with observation. And that particular term there literally means you cannot perceive or apprehend or comprehend the kingdom of God by mere empirical or physical sight. Any construction of the nature of the kingdom of God at this present time that asserts the capacity to comprehend it apart from a spiritual lens, a lens that is given to you by grace, by which you comprehend things according to the word of God through faith is a false vision of the kingdom. And many assertions of that kind have occurred over the last 2000 years. But what our Lord said, which could be the bulk of our study if we wanted to, was that the kingdom does not come or manifest itself or realize itself to you and me by mere intellectualism by mere human comprehension. That means you and I have a major problem when it comes to the kingdom of God. That on our part, we are woefully blinded to the reality of spiritual things if God does not grant us the capacity to see them. It is upon this context that Christ lays out in the following words why it will be that when he comes in his judgments, some men will be aware and some will not. Some men will be taken in the judgment and others freed from that judgment. And this concept is what we're going to be running through in verse 11 of Revelation 22 today. But just simply listen to the ultimate Old Testament prophet, Jesus Christ himself. Now, you and I know he's more than a prophet. But he's also a prophet because as the Yahweh's uh, Mishia, as the Lord's, uh, uh, if you will, Hashem, as the Lord's final prophet, Jesus Christ capstones all of the prophecies of the Old Testament. And here's what he says in verse 22. And he said unto his disciples. Now, who is he speaking to? His disciples. The days will come when you shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you shall not see it. What was he talking about? He's still staying within the vein of a proper kind of scene that requires faith based upon a revelatory knowledge of God. What is he saying? The disciples that enjoyed for three and a half years the very presence of God himself in the person of Christ. They had enjoyed having been drawn near to him by his grace. Having been made part of his company as being called disciples, having been brought into a place of nearness and fellowship with Christ so that they could see the world through the eyes of their master in a proper way. They have been blessed with the nearness of the Lord Jesus with them. If you will, the light of the world was with these disciples and so they could see clearly what Christ was intimating was one day this will not be so. And it wasn't to be some 2,000 years down the line, but shortly after his death, the world would then once again descend into a kind of darkness for which without spiritual eyes, you would not be able to pierce through the obscurity of darkness and demonism and sin as would emerge 
out of the Roman Empire and out of apostate Judaism. This is what the disciples are being told by Christ. You will desire the day when you can hang out with him who is called the desire of all nations, the man that could heal every person that came his way, the man that could open the eyes of the blind, the man that could raise the dead, the man that could speak things into existence, turn water to wine, multiply the loaves of bread, walk on water. The man that was upholding the whole universe by himself at the same time that he was eating fish with his disciples. They would desire one of those days and they would not see it. And such is the cycle of God's redemptive purposes in our world. From time to time, the world goes dark. And then in God's mercy, he causes the son of righteousness to rise with healing in his wings and brings about another season of mercy. And then the lights go out again. The sun descends. And so he says in verse 23, this is what happens. They shall say unto you, see here or see there, do not go after them nor follow them. For as the lightning that lightens out of one part of the heaven shines unto the other part of heaven, so shall also the son of man be in his day. I love this because what he's telling his disciple is you don't need to get caught up in gurus who have a special knowledge of Christ for which you have to leave the main path of gospel purposes to kind of go into the taverns and into the crevices and down into the deep holes of their speculative theories about where Jesus is. You don't have to believe that Jesus is hiding under a rock or in a cave or on the top of the mountain with some special illuminary. You can know that when Jesus shows up in his sovereign power, whether providentially, whether in the acts of nature, whether in the movement of nations and kingdoms, as Christ is Lord of all, you'll see it very clearly if you have eyes to see. He's using the, again, the formulaic language of the prophets. He's saying, when I come, it'll be like the lightning shining out of one end of heaven to the other. Do y'all know what that means? Nobody can miss it. How many of you guys ever caught a Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi lightning storm? Once the light cuts on, everybody is exposed, are they not? All at the same time. There's nobody in that group collective experience that says, now what was that? When Christ comes in his power, everybody knows it. You and I don't have to join secret cults heterodoxical uh, systems of theology are kooks who somehow can tell you that they know Jesus in a special way of which you can't know him for yourself in the word of God and in the gospel of his glory. And so what Jesus is telling his disciples, fellas, you are the ones with the keys to the kingdom, not them. So don't get caught up in the weakness of human curiosity and drift off the path of orthodoxy. He goes on to say, in verse 25, but first he must suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. What generation is he talking about? The one he was speaking to. Contextualizing scripture as we must, he was speaking to his disciples about his own Jewish people who missed him when he came. And the evidence that they missed him is that they killed him. Because had they caught him, they would have loved him. And he goes on to say these words too. And as it was in the days of Noe, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, drink, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noe entered into the ark. And the flood came and did what? Destroyed them all. Destroyed them all. They were taken in judgment. And notice how he adds to this. Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they did drink, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it what? Rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Again, another group of people taken in the judgment. And then he says it again. Even thus shall it be in the days of the Son of Man when he is revealed. And in that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and, and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. What is our Lord saying? There's an urgency about his coming in judgment that actually indicates either you are ready or you're not. And he goes on to say, 
Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, in that day, in that day there shall be two men in one bed. That is, please get that right. This is a whole different culture today. Get it right. There'll be two men resting in the same repose and recline area in which men rested and women rested in their own places and men did as well. You guys know that. A healthy divide between the genders. At least we got distinction of genders here, do we not? And the text tells us that two shall be grinding in, together in the field, working in the field. One shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. And they answered and said unto him, where, Lord, where, where shall they be taken? And he says, wheresoever the body is, that is Toma, that means a dead body, there will the eagles be gathered, really vultures, they shall be gathered together. And he was using a euphemism, a symbolism of the judgment of the Roman Empire coming in with its standard bearer of eagles, as we have in America, coming as the judgment that will come down upon Israel because of its rebellion against God, you guys know that this is the case. And the disciples are being told by their master, you can know that these things are going to occur. So when they occur, you'll have to use what? Discernment. Now turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation 22, 11. I'm laying a foundation for what I want to talk about. And I hopefully I can get through at least one point before you go to sleep on me. This is extremely important. You really want to hear Christ's words here. You really want to hear it. You really want to hear what Christ has to say. Now, when you start back at the previous verse, I want to lay a context for this. And then we're going to dive in deeply. And he said unto me, do not seal the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Isn't that what I taught you a couple of weeks ago? That the book of the apocalypse is designed to be open. It is to remain open until him who gave the book, that is the Lord Jesus, who got it from his father, that is Yahweh one, given to John to give to us until he literally, visibly and practically shows up. The apocalypse is to stay open. It is an open revelation of the sovereign rule of Christ from his throne in glory over all the kingdoms of the world in order that the church might know that it actually operates out of a power greater than the systems of this world and that the church might know how things will transpire over. Says, Keep it open for the time is what? It's near, it's at hand, it's right up on you. And so he says these words in verse 20, uh, verse 11. He that is unjust, let him remain unjust. I'm going to unpack that a little more in a moment. And he which is filthy, let him remain filthy still. And the one that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him Remain holy. This here is what you call your proverb, your proverbial quaternium. It's a prose of statements done in couplets of twos. The two really represents one. The unrighteous and the filthy is one category of people. The righteous and the holy is another category of people. These are called paradoxical parallelisms. And what we are going to do in a moment here is understand the behavior of both of those groups at a time in which they have already been warned. I'm on my way. That's verse 7a. And my reward is with me. That's verse 12. To give unto every man according as his work shall be. Now, the way in which Christ is laying this out for his disciples can be understood this way, child of God. It is an ominous warning and insight. And I want you to capture this. It's an ominous warning and insight given to the wise in Christ. This verse 11 in Revelation 22 is not for the lost. It's not for the unsaved. It's for the wise in Christ. If you're wise in Christ, you want to understand verse 11. It's not for the unsaved world. This is not a warning to men and women in general. This is actually an ominous warning and insight given to the wise in Christ. So if you're wise in Christ today, this is for you. And I want you to capture what he's going to explain. What it's talking about is the inherent character and therefore conduct of two classes of men. This is what I mean. The inherent 
character and therefore conduct of two classes of men. This actually is not only contextually historically true in Jesus' day, this is a general principle across the spectrum of time from Adam to the last man that's born into this world. Are you guys following me? There's only two kinds of people, ultimately, that manifest themselves to be either of the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of light. And what God wants you and I to understand is how these two categories or this binary expression manifest themselves, even under the most precarious of circumstances. And the results of their behaviors actually end up being in conflict with each other, mutually in conflict with each other and it will remain that way until Christ comes. So you inherently you guys can get this if you take it as a kind of microcosmic uh, uh, locational experience. You will have times in the which you are engaged with people who are operating out of that other character set, right? And immediately because you are of one kind of qualitative character set and they are of another, you inherently are going to experience conflict. So you are to derive from this scripture that what Jesus is saying to all of us is, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, the moment you run across this other system, this other category of people, you're going to be in conflict. So don't expect freedom from conflict until I come. So it's important to get that I'm still not into my message because I want to massage your mind to open it up in order for you to be able to capture what's in the text that you don't see, but is supported and demanded of by the totality of Scripture on a theological level. We are all born, ladies and gentlemen, into systems. Would you agree with that? All born into systems and structures and, and conditions for which, listen now, we had no choice in the matter. This is so obvious and so plain to a person that has not lost their mind. We are all born into systems and structures and cultures and contexts for which you and I had no choice in the matter. Accept it. Now embrace this because this is important. This is what Jesus is teaching here and we need to capture it. Personal human decisions had absolutely no role in your being brought into being naturally. Would that make sense to you? Personal volitional choice on your part had nothing to do with who your mama and daddy was. The time they lived in, the country they grew up in, the cultural context in which they lived, whether you were German or whether you were American or whether you were French or whatever the case may be, those are things that were bigger than you and me. You and I were caught up in the systems but for which once we emerged into being, we were already part of a product of a culture that was already functioning. Am I making sense? It's important for you to get that because there's a fallacy that you must overcome if you're going to be able to ride with Jesus. No pun intended. But it's important for you to capture this, that your being and my being, our existence is the consequence of other predetermined factors that existed way before we did. And, and we all need help from God to comprehend this mystery. Your being and my being is a mystery. Your being here and my being here is a mystery. It's a mystery that you and I are born as human creatures and not donkeys and asses. Now I want you to capture that. I'm trying to get you to relax, but at the same time hone in on inherent truth here because it's important in terms of what Christ was teaching the first century church and where you and I need to be able to maintain our equilibrium in the day in which we live. We are all operating out of factors that we have no control over. We are all operating out of conditions and situations for which somebody else prepared it. We have to learn how to put up with it and then function in it. Am I making some sense? But now when you know the true and the living God, you have a caveat with these factors that you have no control over. You can say, God, have mercy. Now, this is going to come home in a minute as a very useful tool when you get in trouble and you realize the trouble you are in is partially because you had no say in the matter. Now, when a man or a woman comes to realize that they are who they are, where they are, going through what they're going through, largely in part, but not totally, by decisions and choices that you made, 
but ultimately not as you being the original cause of these things. The only thing you can do when you're in that kind of predicament, if you're smart, is say, God, have mercy. Am I making some sense? And the reason why, child of God, is because you and I are part of grand mystery concepts and ideas that are still too big for our brain to get around. And secondly, they are too powerful in their intrinsic capacity and force to influence us for our own volition and will to change them. There's a lot of things in your life you would love to have changed. They're not changing, at least not by you. At least not by you. But now remember, God have mercy. That's going to be a key here in a moment. It's going to be a key. And remember what I've taught you, many of you who've drawn near to me over the last year and a half. God resists the what? But he gives what? To who? So when you go, God have mercy, you have at your accessibility the possibility of God explaining things to you as to why you're going through what you're going through. So here, I, I assert that because you and I have been exposed to and part of what I call two nets. One is the evil net. This is the metaphor of the drag net, fishing drag net. One is the evil net, the evil net of fallen humanity, which brought us into this world of pathological and predatorial existence. You and I were born into a predatory system because we were born in Adam. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 22a. In Adam, all what? Die. All die. In Adam 1, all do what? All right, so you and I are living a, a life of constant death on many layers, are we not? Now, that is the predator, predatorial predicament that we're in. I didn't ask to be here, did you? But we're here. We're here, and that's called the evil net. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on down the line. The evil net of fallen humanity, which brought us into this crazy predatorial existence in Adam all that. But conversely, many of us, I hope all of you might be the objects of what I call the gospel net of the redemptive mercies of God in Christ. So there was a net that brought you into this world in Adam. And there was a net that brought you up out of that world into another world by its intersection or interjection into the world of Adam one to bring you in by force of power, by purpose and providence into a new net called the gospel net, the drag net of redemption and mercy. And now you're on a whole nother trajectory by yet a power that is greater than you. Did that make some sense? By yet a power that is greater than you. So you came in under a power that you didn't know and it was greater than you. And then in God's mercy, he reached down and intercepted your hellbound state and placed you within another dragnet of redemptive purpose in Christ. And now you're headed in a whole nother direction for which 1 Corinthians 15, 22 B says in Christ, all shall be made alive. This is the overarching reality for all of us. Are y'all with me? And I'm getting ready to go to work because I want you to understand this. It requires humility to embrace the reality that I didn't start this thing and I'm not finishing it. It requires humility to embrace the reality that I didn't start it. I'm not finishing it. And by myself, I can't change a thing. It takes humility to grasp that reality. But again, remember, God loves people like that because he'll give you an answer if you realize you didn't start it, you can't finish it, and you can't change it. Now that takes a revelation in itself because you've got people who think they started this thing. You've got people who think that they can finish this thing. And you've got people who actually think that in their own power, in their own might, in their own capacity, they can change it. How foolish. You know what that means? They know nothing of mystery. They know nothing of mystery. They actually think they see everything and have no idea that there was a power that actually operated in their life that brought them into the wicked predicament that they were in. See what Jesus said in John 8, 44, speaking again to the rulers. He said, you are of your father, the devil. 
And you know what Jesus did right there in John 8, 44? He gave the origin of the evil power that was behind driving their actions. And until they can own the fact that their father is the devil, they cannot see that their nature is bent in a way that's contrary to God. Am I making sense? And yet at the same time in 1 John chapter uh, 5, around verse 20, 18, Jesus says, or John says, the same John says, and we know that whosoever is born of God does not continue practicing sin, and he is one who keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. That's what First John lays out for us. And what does that mean? That means if you're a child of the living God, you didn't make yourself a child of the living God. You were born of God. God saved you and God quickened you and God regenerated you and God gave you life. Now watch it. And then he gave you a new nature. Now that new nature in you is following a course that corresponds with the nature that you have. And these are the two people groups in Revelation chapter 22, 11. The righteous and the unrighteous. The holy and the filthy. Y'all with me? I'm going to exegete that text a little bit more as we get ready to close. But I wanted you to capture the overarching optic because of what Jesus said in, in uh, Luke's gospel, chapter 17, which he said in Matthew 24. Apparently, what Jesus was teaching there was there were days coming where all kinds of evil would take place. But because men were so blinded to it, they would keep living life as normal. They would just go on about their merry way with the same patterns and traditions and cultural responsibilities as if Jesus never said there was an evil day coming. Am I making some sense? All right. And the question would be raised for you and me. Do we recognize whether or not we are able to see the evil days? Because if we're trapped in that category of the unjust and the filthy, we don't see the evil days. We don't see them coming. We don't see them emerging. We don't see them increasing. And therefore, we go on as if life is normal. This is what we what they call in science the uh, the continuity principle, that there has nothing in our universe that has had a cataclysmic change since the beginning of time. But that would be a lie biblically. Our world has gone through major cataclysmic changes, has it not? But you wouldn't know that unless you read the word of God, because the word of God is a history book that goes all the way back to the beginning of time. And, and they cover up their failure to recognize these major cataclysmic events by saying, watch this, everything is normal. Where's the promise of his coming? We've been hearing you Christians talking about Jesus coming for thousands of years now. Well, he has been coming. And if you don't see it, that's your problem. Many of us know he came. All right, so let's go to work just a little bit. It's extremely important. So I just want you to remember now we're dealing with two nets. The net of fallen humanity brought in through Adam, in Adam all sin. And the net, the gospel net of redemptive mercy and salvation in Christ. In Christ all shall be made alive. Two opposite destinies. Two major power systems. Governing the masses of the people. Now, the only thing you and I contribute to it, I want you to get this, is that by our conduct, we affirm the kingdom that we're in. Our conduct, our choices, our behavior, our actions are not the causes of us being there. They are the evidence that we are part of that kingdom. Am I making sense? So when Jesus said back in John chapter 8, 44, you are of your father, the devil origin, and the works of your father you will do, practice. You are of your father, the devil, origin. And the works of your father you will do. The evidence by your works tells you where your origin is. Y'all got that? And this is why Jesus is warning in Revelation 22, 11, Watch particularly how men conduct themselves. Because how they conduct themselves will determine their origin. Y'all got that? All right, so let's continue working through the proposition that's really rooted in the title of my message. The New Jerusalem caught in the conditions of our heart. Caught in the conditions of our heart. When Jesus says in verse 11, he that is unjust, let that man or woman remain unjust. And he which is filthy, 
Let that man or woman remain filthy. And he that is righteous, let that man or woman remain righteous. And he that is holy, let that man or woman remain holy. Hence, we are caught in the conditions of our heart. Did you get that? By divine decree, what Christ is saying is there's a time coming wherein men and women will be locked in their natures and there will be nothing they can do about it. Now, this is because this decree is couched between the two principles I shared with you earlier. The first one in uh, verse 7, part A, I am on my way. And the other one is in verse 12, and my reward is with me to give unto every man according as his work shall be. Between those two promises, listen, men and women are trapped. What that teaches you and I then is that we don't always have a day of redemption by which turning can take place, by which the wicked man can be brought up out of his wickedness and be made the righteousness of God in Christ. By which a wicked person can turn from his evil ways and then be able to engage in the good works of gospel purposes. What we are being taught is there's a time when all that's over with. And that's what Jesus was teaching you in Luke 17. You will look for the days of the Son of Man and they shall not be. You won't find the days of the Son of Man because the days of the Son of Man are the days when the gospel is preached in power. And men and women have a vivid testimony of the reality of who God is and the reality of who they are and the reality of their need for salvation. And they have the presence of the Spirit of God able to tug on the heart and illuminate the mind and create crisis in the soul. And cause them to bow the knee. What must we do to be saved? There's an hour coming when that won't happen again. And men and women will simply be left in their rotten condition or their redeemed condition. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? That's important for you to get that because it would be a lie for you to tell somebody God's always there for you. That would mean you don't know your Bible. And so it's time for us to work caught in the conditions of our heart. So here are two sub points that I want to develop. The first is rebellion is a fixed spiritual condition. Rebellion is a fixed spiritual condition. The first group of people that should be able to say amen to that are redeemed people. If you're sitting there saying, oh, I don't understand what that means. You must not be redeemed. Because redeemed people know that rebellion on their part goes to the core of their being and that they could never change their rebellious ways if God didn't intercept, if God didn't intervene, if God didn't radically, radically move in their life. Under our first sub point, rebellion is a fixed spiritual condition. May I say the will of man is so incorrigibly trapped by his fallen nature that he, he can even know what is right. It can be revealed to him moments before it happens and he will still face his calamity in utter defiance of the will and revelation of God. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So now let me help you understand that biblically. Biblically, all through the scriptures, guess what you discover? God will tell you to turn. God will tell you the judgment is coming and you won't. He did this with Cain. Genesis 4, you don't have to go there. In his kindness, he told Cain, I see what you look like and I can tell by your face that your heart ain't right. At least he wasn't a hypocrite. You know, you got hypocrites. Smiling faces show no traces. <laughs> At least he wasn't a hypocrite. And God loved him enough to say, hey, Cain, you got a problem, brother. Sin is lying at the door and it's ready to take over and be your master. And the outcome is not good. And do you know what Cain did? Cain in his rebellion just basically ignored what God in his kindness had shared with him. You guys know the outcome. This is what Jesus was saying when he said in Luke chapter 17, as well as Matthew 24, as it was in the days of Noah. 
Men were eating and drinking. And Noah was preaching the gospel for 120 years, warning the whole world to repent, to turn from their evil ways. God's going to pour down a judgment that will wipe out all flesh. We don't need to go there for time's sake. But Genesis 6 lays it out that God had already examined the hearts of every man. And he saw that there was only evil continually working up through the pores of their volition, of their attitude, of their motions, of their conduct. And then it manifested itself in tribal groups and then into larger state groups. And they became marauders and criminals. And the whole earth was ruined by the evil hearts of rebellious man. And what God had done during that time, he told Noah to build an ark for 120 years. It was the message of redemption in Christ Jesus. And that if they were not going to be taken in the judgment, they would have to hurry up and get in that boat. But what did they do? In their obstinacy, they let week, month, and year go by to the tune of 100 years. And in the very same day that it started raining down, the only people that entered into the boat were Noah, his three sons, their wives, and his wife. And eight souls were delivered from a judgment that came down on humanity. Y'all saw that? We see it again in the days of Lot. That's what Jesus was saying. Can you imagine Lot was in Sodom for a good 20 years? We know that because him and his wife went down there and, you know, they were going to just have a business on the outside of San Francisco somewhere in, uh, and, 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 you know, Marin County or San Mateo. And they did it for a few years and then they moved on into the city. And Lot started his business and his business was prospering. But San Francisco is what San Francisco is anywhere in the world. Y'all know that. Anywhere in the world, San Francisco is what San Francisco is. But here's what you must know. Lot was a stupid believer. How many stupid believers in the house? Keep your hand down. <laughs> Keep your hand down. There are stupid believers in the house. Stupid believers in the house who think you can live in that community and it not corrupt you. You think you can, but you can't. You think you can, but you can't. And so over time, Lot not only moved into the city from outside, but he became one of the judges. He thought he would legislate them into righteousness. So he's preaching the gospel because he's a child of God, but he's powerless because he's in sin. He's, he's telling them, I know Yahweh, my uncle Abraham is the father of the faithful and, 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 and God is our God. But his conduct is indicating that he didn't trust Yahweh. So who should listen to a Christian who doesn't believe his own God? And so what was happening is they were increasing in their whole diversity, inclusion, equity system of intersectionality and all. Of, they were doing that. Sodom was the first culture experiencing what it means to be a whole cell community that had abandoned heterosexuality from the greatest to the youngest of them. That model is what's being implemented now in our world. Whether you want to believe it or not, I don't care what you say. They're starting with your kids. So Lot tried to do the best he could, but because he was a hypocrite and he didn't have the power of God, it overtook his household too. And by the time the angels came, Lot tried to tell his sons and, and daughters, hey, the judgment is coming. But they said, oh, look, you ain't been to church in 50 years. Shut up. And it was really true. It was really true. The world had got Lot. So they couldn't hear their daddy. Because he was a hypocrite. And what happened? The judgment came down. Did it not? And so even though Sodom and Gomorrah have been having warnings, I mean, we can go into this at length. Sodom and Gomorrah is closer to you and me than you might want to admit. They are our cousins and our kinfolk and our nature. It's just only God has kept some of us from that delusion. Lot escaped narrowly by the grace of God. And the rest were taken in judgment, including his rebellious wife, whose heart was in Sodom while the angel was delivering her which is a grand picture of how you can, as it were, be in the church, but be in the world still. You can have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. Am I making sense? 
And then this, op- this optic increases to national Israel. Of course it does. God delivers them by that dragnet uh, symbolically out of Egypt and takes them into the wilderness. But many of them had their hearts still in Egypt, did they not? And so they perish because the word not mixed with faith in them did not profit them. Am I making sense? Right. It's very important for us to understand that this here is a a cross generational uh, syndrome that humanity is facing. It's just a a powerful, powerful reality. And and look at how uh, Christ addresses this in his patience in Revelation chapter two. Verse 21, look at it. This is where the great high priest, our Melchizedek, our king and our priest, the Lord Jesus under the new covenant in which we are all operating is speaking in the uh, analytical, critical analysis of his call as the shepherd and as the high priest to examine the health and quality of the sheep. And here he's saying to the church at Thyatira, you guys got a problem. Just go back to verse 20, if you will. You allow that woman Jezebel to teach who calls herself a prophetess and she's teaching and she's doing what? Seducing my servants to do what? Commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, saints, this is not a New Testament phenomenon. This goes all the way back to the Old Testament. Again, this is the formulaic language of the prophet. The children of Israel constantly committed idolatry, did they not? And therefore, they constantly ate things offered to idols, did they not? And therefore, they were constantly in spiritual adultery and in spiritual fornication, were they not? Now watch this. Now watch what the lovely Lord Jesus says in verse 21. Verse 21. I gave her space. See it? You all with me? The Lord is long-suffering. Epithumia. The thermometer takes his time rising when it comes to God. His thermometer rises, but it rises slowly. Y'all got that? Epithumia. And it rises slowly enough for men's heart to harden and think just because God is slow, God doesn't care. And it rises slow enough for brokenhearted sinners to find mercy in time of need and call upon the Lord while he is near. I'm almost there. But what he did with Jezebel was give her time to repent. I gave her space to repent of her fornication. Here it is. Are you ready? The impenitency of the hardness of the heart that cannot change even though you want it. And she would not. All right. God gave you time. And you showed that you were of your father, the devil. And the works of your father, you would do. Because you guys know God gave the devil time. And then his time was up because he's living on a short period of time. Now, y'all do know that, right? He has great wrath because his time is what? Short. And he will never repent. The devil will never turn. It's not in his nature. And those that are of the devil will not turn either. It's not in their nature. And Jezebel didn't turn because it wasn't in her nature. I'm going to talk about that if you guys give me time. It's not in her nature. But our master gave her time, didn't he? He gave her patience. He gave her time to repent. But she what? Now, why not? Why not? Listen to how Isaiah put it. Isaiah 26, verse 10 and 11. I want you to hear this. Why is it Isaiah? Why is it Malachi? Why is it Jeremiah? Why is it Ezekiel? Why is it John the Baptist? Why is it Peter, James, and John? Why is it Paul? Why is it John? Why is it Jesus? That she would not. Watch this. Verse 10. Let favor be showed to the wicked. Do you guys see that? Tell them and teach them and communicate to them about the grace of God. That's what our word favor there means. Has said that idea is the loving kindness of the Lord, the long suffering of the Lord and the counterintuitive response of God towards your sin in the substitutionary work of Christ. Because God in his holiness must punish sin. 
And if he doesn't punish your sin, he has to be counterintuitive, does he not? He has to operate contrary to what he would do in punishing sin immediately by punishing your sin somewhere else and then showing you his mercy in that other place where his judgment came down and he's letting you know this is where your escape is. Let mercy be shown to the wicked, yet will he not learn righteousness. Revelation twenty two eleven. Let the unrighteous remain unrighteous still. You got it? Yep. Let the unrighteous remain unrighteous still. In the land of uprightness will he deal unjustly. This here is speaking contextually concerning the nation of Israel. The land of uprightness was Palestine. It's the place where God abode, where revelation was, where the temple was, where the priesthood was, where the prophets were, where the word of God was, right? In the land of uprightness. Watch this. Watch this. Will he deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the what? He will not look to Christ. He will not see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. When Christ comes, this is 700 years before Yahweh showed up. Yahweh told them when Christ comes, you're going to hide your face from him. You're going to consider him unclean. You're going to esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. You're going to reject him. That's because in our nature, we are so desperately wicked that when God even comes to us in mercy, we shirk his mercy. Look at verse 11. Lord, when your hand is lifted up, and if you don't know euphemism in scripture, this here is a metaphor of what we call anthropomorphism. God is coming in the form of a man. He has a face. We just talked about that. That face is Jesus. He has a hand. The hand represents his what? Power! By an outstretched hand and a mighty arm, did God not deliver his people Israel out of Egypt? Isaiah also speaks of it in Isaiah 53. Don't go there. To whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Who is the arm of the Lord? Christ. The wisdom of God and the power of God. He says even when that's revealed, they still won't turn. Notice what the text says. They will not what? They will not see. Remember what I told you? To know me is to love me. To love me is to see me. If you don't see me, it means you don't know me. It's because you don't love me. I told you that. I told you that. Watch this. But they shall see and they shall be ashamed for their envy at the people. Yea, the fire of your enemies shall devour them. There it is. It's the same formulaic prophetic language Christ is using in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and Luke 17. Is he not? Fire is coming. Fire is coming. When you and I don't accept the fire on the altar where the sacrifice is laid out as a substitute for sinners, then you and I will have to receive the fire that comes down upon us because God is holy and he cannot put up with sin. Y'all with me? Y'all with me? This is what our text is teaching us. So it's some, some very important things to learn as we are moving toward the end of the apocalypse. So we see how that Cain did not respond appropriately. Noah's day, Lot's day, Israel's day, Lot's wife. As I stated, they won't hear even when the gospel's preached in the fullness of his glory. Because within you, you don't have the ability, man, woman, child, to change yourself. You need somebody else operating on the outside of you to come inside you and do something for you that you can't do for yourself. That's what you need. All right, so let me bring you to the next point. Rebellion is a fixed spiritual condition. That's Jeremiah 17, 9. You know it. We quote it all the time here at Grace because we're not afraid to tell mankind your condition is irreparable. See, we're not seeker-friendly. We're not a seeker-friendly church. We love people and we're seeking people. But we're not seeking to carve out a gospel that makes you feel good and deny the glory of God. It just is not worth it. It's not worth that. First of all, I'll still be sending you to hell by a gospel that does not have God's authority on it. But I'll be in hell before you will. Now, that's stupid. Now, that's real stupid. Right. I'm going to jump in first and then you come in and after me by that which we are calling the euangelion, the gospel. That is not gospel. 
That is not gospel. But the other thing, this is extremely important. So on the one hand, your rebellion is fixed. On the other hand, this is an extremely important truth. Repentance. Watch this. Now, repentance is a divine gift given only in time. So I want you to work with that. Repentance is a divine gift. In other words, you don't have the ability to repent yourself. You won't do it. You've already tried. I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit tomorrow. I'm going to quit next week. Did you understand? And so, so what you and I are buying is a bunch of humanistic, irrational, illogical, unscientific, non-theological propositions that doesn't correspond with reality. So Jesus said it in the gospel of Matthew chapter seven, every good tree brings forth fruit of its own kind. Conversely, he says an evil tree cannot bring forth good fruit. That means if you and I are evil by nature, we cannot expect to produce good fruit by ourselves unless there is an uprooting of our nature taken out and a new nature placed in so that we're engrafted into another tree that's good by nature, we will never ever see good emerging out of ourselves. Am I making sense? This is why he's saying here, rebellion is a fixed condition and repentance is a divine gift in time. You guys have heard it, Isaiah 55, verse six and seven. Let it come home now. Because we're turning the corner. I've got a few more things to say. You've heard this before, but I want to drill it home now. Isaiah 55, 6 says, seek ye the Lord while he what? That is clearly inferring that there's a day he won't be found. You guys are rational. You know how to read. Your Bible is telling you there's a day when he won't be found. Isn't that what Jesus said in Luke chapter 17? You will see one of the days of the Son of Man and there will be no day to see. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Do what? Call upon him while he is what? Right? So you know your Bible. When we're dealing with anthropomorphisms, we're dealing with those locational metaphors where God is either near or afar off. Right? And some of us know because we're honest Redeem Christians, we're very honest about the times in which God is near to us and when God is far away from us. Are we honest about that? We know that it's cold when God is far away. We know that we have no confidence. We have no stability, no equilibrium. We have no spiritual vitality. We are not consistent. Our faith is whittled down to almost nothing when God is far away from us. We are as carnal as any unsaved person when God is far from us. And it's to teach you and me that without him, we can do nothing. He has no intention for his children to be walking afar off from him, somehow thinking they can do God's will and get the glory as a consequence of their own power. Perish the thought. If God's son will ever do anything for God, it will be because God is working in them the will and to do of his good pleasure. And as a consequence, it will be so evident that it's God that you and I won't have to explain what just happened. The text tells us to call upon the Lord while he is near, while he is near, because it's a season when he is not. Verse seven. Verse 7 says, let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man is thought, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. This is what is called the euangelion. This is the overture of the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. That's what you hear, is it not? Please, now I want you to capture this. Get offended, great, we can talk about it. I want you to hear this. When God calls upon you to repent... And you are left in your native condition. And Adam, he knows you won't. Did you hear what I just stated? When he calls upon you to repent and you're left in your Adamic state, he knows you won't. Now, this ought to be uh, this ought to be a a form of relief for rational minds. Because that means God is not stupid. Now, if I were God. 
And I knew that you wouldn't repent, even though I tell you, stop. Now, boy, stop. How many times do I have to tell you to stop? Sound like a parent, right? To stop. And you know they're not going to stop. Now, you know they're not going to stop, and therefore you have to engage measures to get them to stop, don't you? That's called the grace of God. That's called God intervening to stop you and your mad dash to hell by disrupting your rebellion by a power that's greater than the power that's in you. This is what we call the power of the gospel on the salvation. The ability to bust up your volition, your will, your evil passion, your evil drives against God. Because he loves you enough to bust it up. Otherwise, he'll leave you to your will and let you go to a burning hell, which is what men want. Am I making sense? Right. Right. Look, I love my kids. Do you love your kids? And if my, if my son or my daughter, they thought they were smarter than dad, and all of them have tried that once or twice, thought they were smarter than dad, and I realize I can see evils that they cannot see. Because I've been there, bought the whole package, the whole box, not just the t-shirt, the box. I was going to sell it because I was in the sales, right? So I bought the, the whole package of rebel against my authorities, rebel against my parents. My parents don't know what I know. I'm, I'm better than them. I'm smarter than them. Twice stupider than them. Twice stupider than them. And our kids will try it. But if you knew that your son didn't have the capacity to cross the street before that light turned red, and that, that was a busy highway with big Mack trucks running all across that yellow strip that encompasses their walk. And they, they, they said, Daddy, I can do it. I can cross that street. And you go, no, nah, I've been watching you, boy. You don't run that fast. No, nah, don't go. No, I want to go. And in the obstinacy of his will, he tells his dad, look, dad, if you love me, you'll let me go. Is he telling the truth? He's lying. He's wanting to shirk his responsibility to submit to his father because he wants his own will to be God. And if God lets him go, he'll be run over by that Mack truck because he has no capacity to get to the other side all by himself. But if God loves him, He'll see to it that he rescues him from his own blindness and ignorance before he is demolished by the calamity of his rebellion. Am I making sense? It's important for you to understand that's how the gospel works. The gospel doesn't wait on you. The gospel doesn't wait on you, child. The gospel doesn't wait on you. It rescues you. It comes after you. Doesn't wait on you. If it waited on you, there'd be none that would come. Let the wicked forsake his way, he won't. Let the unrighteous man abandon his thoughts, he won't. God has to actually enter in to change his condition. And you and I know that that is exactly what he did for us. It's exactly what he did for us. Repentance is a divine gift only in time. Listen to Proverbs chapter 1, 24 through 28. It lays it out. This is Proverbs 124, the metaphor of the church being a woman that's calling simple, silly men and women to wisdom. And that's what the gospel is, the wisdom of God, is it not? Yeah. Listen to it. Because I have called, this is what God says, and you have what? Refuse. I have stretched out my hand and no man what? Regard it. This is actually encapsulating everything we've been saying, is it not? Yeah. Now look at the next verse. Verse 25, but you have said it not all my counsel and you would not hear any of my correction. Doesn't this describe a rebellious child who does not want to submit to a loving parent? Right. This is where we are in the condition that we're in in our world with God. I want you to know that this is where we are. And particularly today, collectively as a global agenda, we are saying to God, we don't want to have anything to do with your counsel. Listen to it. Verse 26, listen to it. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear comes. Verse 27. 
When your fear comes as desolation and your destruction comes as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish comes upon you, verse 28, then shall you call upon me, but I will not answer. Do you see it? They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Do you see it? All right, because that's when the window closes, there's no more mercy. When the window closes, there's no more mercy. This here is an allusion to Revelation chapter 8 and 9. Men will seek death and will not find it. This is, this is what Jesus is teaching. This is what's taught in Revelation chapter 6, verse 15, if you will. Listen to how Revelation chapter 6 lays it out in verse. You've heard this language in Revelation chapter 6, verse 15, where um, the seven seals are taking place and the uh, sixth seal is underscoring the judgment of God coming upon rebel men and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and mighty men and every bondman and every free man did what? Hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Why? Because the judgment was coming. Now watch what verse 16 says. Verse 16. And said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Now, I want you to capture something. Please listen to what this verse is teaching. It's teaching that when God shows mercy, they won't listen. It's teaching that when God threatens wrath, they won't listen. And the wrath comes down as the wrath is coming down. Guess what? They're running. But they're not running to Christ. Do you see it? They're running. They want God's creation to collaborate with them to cover them from the very judgment that's coming down from heaven upon them because of their persistent rebellion against God. Did y'all get what I just stated? Do you hear what the word of God is saying? Mankind is asking creation to collaborate with them, to hide them from the wrath. Now, who did you hear explain this text in the context of his suffering? Was it not Jesus? In Luke 19, remember what he says? He says, if they've done these things in a green tree, what will they do in a dry tree? He says, the days are coming when you will call for the mountains and for the rocks to hide you from the wrath of the Lamb of God. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? This is first century Judaism. This is the people who had more privileges than anybody else who heard Messiah for 2,000 years and then saw him physically in the flesh for 30-something odd years. And here's what the proverb says. It just lays it out. This is so important for you and I to capture. This is just absolutely critically important. Proverbs chapter 27, 22, as I begin to turn the corner on this, I, I, need, to, I need to cultivate this because verse 11 needs to be understood in light of what we're talking about. Here's, here's a uh, proverb, and it's a very um, profound metaphor, but I think you'll get it here in a moment. Are you ready? Watch this. In Proverbs 27, 22. Though you should bray, that means crush. Bray is the idea of taking a commodity. In this context, it's wheat from which you have harvested the field, and you're taking the wheat that's covered over with the chaff. Are y'all following me? So the wheat has chaff to protect it as it's growing up. Right. But wheat is not profitable until it's separated from the what? Chaff. And so what they do is they put in what is called a big old bar or a pestle and they take a grinder, right? A rod and they break it. They crush it. Are y'all following me? You can do that with small coriander seeds, different kind of seeds. You crush it up. You crush it up. You crush it up. Are y'all? Am I making some sense? You crush it up. Here, the metaphor is that of a fool being placed inside that big pestle and being grinded with a mortar stone, with a mortar rod among the wheat. Is that what the text says? Among the wheat. I want you to get the metaphor. Though you should bray a fool in a mortar among the wheat, the pestle is, is grinding it down. Yet will you not? Yet will he not depart from his foolishness. Listen to what it says. 
Will not his foolishness depart from him? And what's the metaphor describing? A couple things. I want you to get it. So you have a lot of fools who go to church. Obstinate in their rebellious way. And they're placed in among the wheat. Did y'all get what I just said? They're put in that big mortar bowl. And God in his providence is disciplining and chastising and developing character in the wheat. And what is he doing? He's separating the chaff from the precious wheat. Now the wheat are God's elect. The wheat are God's sheep. The wheat are God's people. The wheat in Revelation twenty two eleven are the righteous. Righteous in Christ. Because Christ was that seed himself who first went into the ground and had to die in order to produce the wheat. If you are born again, you are part of the wheat harvest. But God has to sanctify you. So he harvests you in justification and then he crushes you in sanctification. But as he's crushing you in sanctification, he allows fools to pretend that they love him too, to get brought into the discipline of God's elect. And while God is chastening his elect ones, the fool is still not turning from his evil way. Was that clear, child of God? Was that clear? The fool sitting right next to you. Don't turn and look at him. has watched the father, has watched the father graciously and patiently discipline and humble and tenderize and break up the follow ground of the remaining sin in the life of his elect. And it takes years for God to humble us and he's patient. And he won't let you out of that martyr. Because his job is to sanctify you. And so he continues working to separate the wheat from the chaff. And he tells you, you got to put up with the process, child of God. All whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Every son he receives, he scourges. He keeps doing that work. And the wicked... The fool sitting right there saying, man, look, I, look, I ain't going through all that. Yeah, you are, just not now. See, the righteous go through the judgment now. Judgment must first begin at the house of God. And if it's at the house of God, where will the ungodly and wicked appear? Do you understand what I'm saying? The incorrigible, the inexorable rebellion of mankind is clearly laid out by Christ in Revelation 22, 11. And he's letting the righteous know something here. I want y'all to get it now. I think y'all got the assignment. He wants you to get this. Are you ready? It is a wise warning with insight. Go back to Revelation 22, 11. I, I think you're ready now. It's a wise warning with insight. Here's what it's saying. It's saying a, a bunch of things, but I'm just going to keep you for a few more minutes. It's a wise warning with insight. And only the righteous can hear this. Only men and women that are sold out to Christ can hear this. Don't expect the world to change in any dramatic way, no matter how severe Christ's judgments come down upon this planet because of their rebellion. That's the first thing I want you to get. So, you know, we often hear well, all this crazy mess going on. Lord, use this to turn men and women to Christ. It won't work. Please hear me. It won't work. If the flood didn't work, if the fire in, Noah, uh, in, in Lot's day didn't work, if the judgments of God in the days of Pharaoh... Pharaoh's a great example. Chapter 8, 15. When Pharaoh saw God showing respite every time he brought a judgment, his heart only got harder and harder and harder until his narrow tail ended up under the water in the Red Sea. That's how desperately wicked and irretrievably hostile the nature is against God, even when he shows his judgments. 
Are y'all hearing me? I'm not done. I want you to capture this. It's very important. It's very important. So one thing is he's telling his elect, he's telling you and me, don't look for the world to change in any drastic way. And don't set your hope on it. Right? Listen to me now. Child of God, you don't have to be sad. You don't have to be mad. You don't have to be disappointed. You don't have to have your head bowed down. Or your knees. Don't let the devil set you up with a long, ugly face like Cain. Because everybody else is clowning. Understand the privilege of being born again. Having the spirit of the living God living in you. Christ, the hope of glory reigning on your heart. Understand the privilege of you being the light of the world if nobody else wants to be the light in the house. Understand the joy that God gives you because the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Whether the rest of the world wants to rejoice in Christ or not, the Spirit of God can give you the ability to rejoice in him all by yourself. When nobody else wants to rejoice, you can. You don't have to dance to the world's tune because the world is not dancing to the tune of Christ. He calls them to dance, they mourn. He calls them to mourn, they dance. They are constantly in rebellion against the counsel of God's glory. Don't let them determine the temperature in your heart. Don't let them put on you faulty bifocals. See with the eyes of the Holy Spirit. See with the eyes of the Word of God. See with the lens of the Gospel. Let your heart be full of grace. Are you hearing me? The reason why is nothing's going to change. In the midst of the mystery of God allowing darkness to take place, in the midst of the mystery, here's what God is doing. God's calling his elect and he's letting the wicked do whatever they want to do. This is the binary character that you have here. This is a great Bible study time now. If you, if you really enjoy getting your hand in the text like we do here at Grace during the studies, if you were dealing with verse 11 from a more exegetical level, if you were dealing with it, here's what you would discover. Here's what you would discover, that the term he that is unjust right there is actually describing what he is doing. He that is practicing injustice, literally, I, dikos, is the Greek term, he that is practicing unrighteousness. Y'all with me? First line, I want y'all to capture this. All right, we're almost headed home. Once you get it. the one that is practicing unrighteousness, and according to your Bible, everything that doesn't correspond with God's will is unrighteous. Right? He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not is unrighteousness. Transgression of the law is unrighteousness. It's sin. Are y'all following that? And the greatest act of unrighteousness a man can commit is to reject the righteousness of God that's freely given in the person of Christ as the grounds of that person's acceptance with God. That's the greatest act of injustice you can do. Y'all follow that? So I want you to understand this imperative, this indicative statement is given first with a verbal manifestation of what wicked people are doing. And that's because of verse 12. But I want you to capture how it goes on. The one that is doing unjustly or behaving unrighteously. Go back to the verse, please, and, and leave it there. The one that is doing unrighteousness and, uh, and unjustice, let him be unjust still. Now, I want you to capture it. Okay, okay, capture it again. The one that is practicing injustice, injustice, let him continue practicing injustice. Now, watch this. And let him add to it. Let it further develop. Let it continue and abound more and more and more. Stay with me. Stay with me. This is a decree from on high to teach you how that Jesus, as a representative of the Father, when he comes, he will overcome when he judge, and when he speaks, he will prevail because men will be caught doing what they do because they're doing what they do according to their nature. 
Did you hear what I just stated? I want you to stay here now. Get a little bit more Bible on you. When you leave, you don't have to come back. I understand. I understand this is tough. But I want you to get this. When God leaves you to yourself, you are a rotten tree that's going to continue bearing bad fruit until you breathe your last breath. Let it alone is the way God put it. Let it alone. That's the way that language is going. That little adverb, that, that word still is what is called an adverb. It actually strengthens the verbal context that's in view. The one that is doing unjustly, let him do unjustly more and more. In other words, God is going to give the world up to a period of increasing evil. This is what Paul taught in 2 Timothy 3, 7, when he says, And evil men will increase in more and more unwickedness. Child of God, do you live in the world that I live in? Is this not true today? Right, so now hear me. If you're a child of God, if you're a sheep, my sheep do what? And what that means is when Christ tells me the world is going to grow more evil, more and more evil, in such a way in which it will blow my mind, in such a way that I cannot get my hands fully around the level and intricacy of the depths of the kind of evil that mankind is engaging in, all I have to remember is that he who sits on the throne said, let it be. Stay with me now. Stay with me. I don't have to waste any sleep over that. I'm not worried about artificial intelligence. I have a God who created all the stoiche, all the elements, all of the molecular structures of the universe. Did you understand what I just said? Not worried about the metaverse that those knuckleheads are trying to create for you guys. See, because the metaverse will never, ever replace God's verse. Did y'all hear that? It will never, ever replace the Bible verse. As long as you got the Bible verse, the metaverse will never, ever come even close to comparing to the Bible verse. I don't care what kind of movies they make. I don't care how they help you lose weight, how they take away your pimples, how they let you become bigger and stronger. I don't care what kind of avatar you get from Facebook. It will never match the glory that will be revealed in us at the time that Jesus Christ comes, right? There is no comparison. Give me a few more minutes. The next line says, let him be filthy still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. Now, when you get to that line, that line is describing indicatively what he is. The first line is what he's doing. The second line is what he is. What he is, is a filthy person in God's sight. Now, filthy here can be understood literally, but it must be comprehended as a profoundly corrupting spiritual quality. Are y'all making, am I making sense? So, it would be used in James chapter 2, verse 2, concerning the poor man that comes into the synagogue wearing vile garments. It would be like the homeless person coming in who hasn't taken a bath in several weeks, and we can smell him before we see him. Y'all got that? But that's only a metaphor because I'd let him in here. Now, I know you church folk wouldn't let him in, but I'd let him in. I'd let him sit up front. Right? Because I understand the inversion principle of recognizing that God does not judge the outward appearance. He judges the heart. But please hear me now. Please. Because I know some of y'all tired of me talking. Listen. The point is, is that unrighteous conduct. Is a consequence of a filthy heart that has not been washed by the blood of the lamb and has not been justified by the cross work of Christ. Am I making sense? Right. So for God, you can look beautiful when you come to church, but if you're filthy on the inside, you are as wretched as the stench and squalor of the man or woman who has lost their mind and don't know the dignity of the Imago Dei, and therefore do not wash. And not, not that washing makes you holy or righteous, but you wash because of who you are, an image bearer of God. And at, as the highest pinnacle of creation, my goodness, if the elephants get in and take a bath, right? If the hippopotamuses get in and take a bath, right? If, if, if the walruses, 
take a bath. If, if all of the animals in the field take baths from time to time, can't we take baths a little bit more than them? Since we are the pinnacle of creation. So all you're doing is indicating you recognize where you come from. When our brothers and sisters are losing their mind out there, they have forgotten where they come from largely. And they don't know how to retain those qualities of external, if you will, phenotype or expression because they are without hope. When you have the hope of the gospel, you learn how to live like it. All right, let me finish up this verse for you. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. Let him that is filthy, let him continue in his filth. I love this because it's in the active verb form. What that means is by indication, if you are filthy in your heart, then you're going to practice filthy behavior in God's sight. You understand what I'm saying? All right. Let him that is righteous. Do you see the phrase? Let him that is righteous. I love this because this is not speaking in a verbal form. This is speaking in an indicative. Let the one that is righteous. That is his position and that is his condition. That's not his practice. That's his state of being. Did y'all understand what I just stated? Let the one that has been declared righteous in God's sight because he has been placed in Christ and Christ has become for him or her their righteousness and thus God declares them the very righteousness of God in him let the man or the woman that is fully positioned in Christ and aware that all that he is they are in him and all that they are he was for them they become the very righteousness of God in Christ let that man or that woman watch this that is righteous let him continue in that righteousness that's a whole nother message because what it indicates is that when a man or woman understands the beauty and splendor and the magnificence of the righteousness of God in Christ as the root of their existence, they will consistently operate out of a pattern of behavior that manifests that righteousness. Did you understand that? Listen to it, 1 John 2, 28. Pull it up. Listen to it. This is what John says in relationship to the coming of Christ. Here's what he says. He says this in 1 John 2, 28. Now, little children, abide in him. That's what that text is saying. If you are the righteousness of God in Christ, abide in him. Because if you abide in him, you will bring forth much fruit. Isn't that what Jesus says? If you abide in me and my word abide in you, you will bring forth much fruit and my father will be glorified. Am I making sense to y'all? In other words, the key to fruit bearing is abiding in Christ, loving him enough to hang out with him as your everything. And it will manifest itself in the priority of your life. It'll manifest itself in the areas of the things that are important to you. In other words, every tree will bring forth fruit of its own kind. Are y'all hearing me? Watch this. And little children, abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have what? Oh, there it is. He's coming. Is he not coming? He's coming. Remember, I'm on my way. So if as he is on his way and we are abiding in him, we don't even have a shadow of a doubt, of a concern that when he comes, we will be caught out of pocket. I'm not going to be caught out of pocket if what I am doing now, I am doing because of who I am in Christ. If I'm in Christ, then I'm going to be in Christ, and the fruit that's going to be born is going to be the fruit that Christ produces through me so that when Jesus shows up, I have no conflict of interest. I have no worry in my mind. I have no worry in my soul. I don't have to be ashamed that it's coming. I'm not tipping and I'm not dipping and I'm not sneaking out with this one and sneaking out with that one. I'm walking in the light of the gospel. I'm resting in the reality of who Jesus is. I'm resting in the reality of who I am in Christ. And I'm happy in Jesus, waiting for Jesus to come back. Does that make some sense? 
Does that make some sense? Right, and this is what you're going to discover next week as we deal with verse 12 through 17. Because there's a woman there calling hell-bound sinners in conjunction with the Holy Ghost. Come, come, I'll tell you what we do. We rejoice in Christ Jesus. We have no confidence in the flesh. We are that circumcision whose hearts have been renewed by the gospel of God's grace. Christ means everything to us. And I'm just waiting for him to bust the heavens and take the rest of my remaining sin and by a nanosecond of divine fiat power change these vile bodies so that they are made like unto his glorious spiritual body so I can worship him at the next level. At the next level. I want to worship him at the next level. So that we may have confidence and not be ashamed that is coming. Look at the next verse. And if you know that he is what? Then you know that everyone that doeth righteousness, they only do it because they're born of God. They don't do it because of any strength in them. They don't do it out of a compelling to merit favor with God. I love God because he's my daddy. I'm his son. <laughs> that's, that's what you do. You love him because he's daddy. Yeah. I serve him because he's worthy. to. Be. What boss on the planet is more worthy to serve than the God that loved you enough to give his son for you? Am I making some sense? Should I start preaching right now? Or should I call it a rap? Because we can exalt him if we want to. We can make him known right now in the joy of our heart if we want to. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. I'm telling you. I'm, te I'm so glad to have been swept up in the gospel net. Happened 40 years ago when I was a child of Adam, headed to hell, walking in my rebellion. And the gospel came along and swooped me up and turned me in another direction. Not by works of righteousness, which I had done, but by his mercy, he saved me by the work of his own righteousness, by the justification of his own son and cleansed my heart by the Holy Ghost, having taken out that stony heart, put in a heart of flesh and even write his laws on my heart and my mind every since. And I'm learning every day how to say, Lord. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Amen, 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 amen. amen.